We're going to have each of our candidates take three minutes uh, for some opening comments to express their position and issues, <coughs> and then we will break out into our questions. And we will begin with uh, Sher Powell. Good evening, everyone. Welcome tonight. And I'll try to talk loud so you can. Hear me? My name is Brett Powell. I've been Logan County Sheriff now for almost 16 years. I've been in law enforcement. I've served this community for 26 years. <coughs> Out of those uh, first uh, two years was with the Sterling Police Department. Then when I went to the Sheriff's Office in 1997 and was elected in 06 and took office in 07. During the last 15 years, we continue to move forward with the Logan County Sheriff's Office to provide uh, consistency and better service to the people of, Cotler, of, of Logan County. I have strived to assemble and maintain a well-trained staff, both in detentions and on the road. And during that time, we have uh, been successful in investigating and prosecuting several high-profile cases. Also during this time, we've been able to better equip our deputies. In the last four years, we've added uh, computers to our patrol cars, which has helped us with our dispatching and responding to calls quicker. Um, we've also added two canines to the Logan County Sheriff's Office. Uh, one is specifically trained in in cell extractions along with drugs and tracking, and the other one is tracking and drugs only. During this 26 years, I've been to numerous supervisor trainings, including field training officer, SWAT supervisor school, to name a few, but the most distinguished uh, training I've been to, I was selected in 2013 to attend the FBI National Academy, and there's only 1% of law enforcement in this country that are selected to do that. And during that time, in that 10 weeks of training, um, I got significant amount of training and leadership and moving forward with uh, educating and training my people. So I look forward to continuing to serve you guys in the next... Uh, Four years, I will answer your questions to the best of my skill and ability tonight. Once again, I've got 26 years of law enforcement experience in this county. I've served this county for 26 <laughs> years. Thank you very much. And now, Craig Gillen. Well, hey, anyway, my name is Craig Gillen. Um, I probably had something canned to write out, but you know what? I guess we're just going to go off the cuff. Uh, I was told, hey, get up here, laugh, have a good time with it, you know. But, and I did, honestly, I did have, I did have a lot of fun out on the campaign trail meeting your people and, and meeting all of you, but it's hard for me to smile. It really is. It's hard for me to smile when you're this passionate about something and you understand the urgency. So, I guess let's just cut to the brass tacks. My candidacy was born out of witnessing a, a preventable tragedy. And drug addiction is a tragedy. And it continued on when I was out talking with other uh, you know, residents of Logan County, and they expressed the same thing over and over again. They didn't feel safe in their community, and that they didn't feel heard. So, as, you, as the candidate, I really felt like I needed to do something that was worthwhile, that it was something that was absolutely worthwhile. And 
There's nothing else I could think of other than just go ahead and move forward with running for sheriff. Now, tonight, you're going to hear, you know, some, you're going to hear some noise, and that's okay. But what it comes down to is my intentions and looking out and seeing what are the issues that are facing Logan County right now. And as I see it, you have to take care of the external and the internal all at the same time. But what really affects, what really affects the service to you is what's taken care of on the inside. How we manage or how the employee life cycle is managed at the Sheriff's Department. That means how you hire or how you attract, how you hire, how you train, and how you set up a manageable package, a, man a manageable um, employees package. And there'll be a lot of this, if, I think there's some questions out there that we can all, that'll probably be asked about what my experience is. But anyway, that's, that's the short of it. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, I just want our partners from Farm Bureau who have reviewed the questions and kind of put them together because there are many like questions to poke their head on in and have them join us and um, give them some appreciation for all of them. So for these questions, then, we'll have the candidates remain at their tables, and we'll have them stand so uh, you can hear. I hope um, things are better as far as acoustics go. We will alternate between each candidate as to who answers the question first. And the first question is, can you list all of your patrol-based experience and credentials? And we'll start with Sharp Paul. Of course, I started with the Sterling Police Department in uh, 1996. I worked there till 97. I went uh, to work for the Sheriff's Office in, in uh, the fall of 97 and uh, was a patrol deputy and patrol sergeant there until I resigned to run for Sheriff in 06. Um, I still currently go out and patrol with my guys. Um, I keep up with the training that everybody else uh, has to keep up. We're required to do at least 24 hours of training a year by post standards. I said, so I do maintain that plus whatever extra trainings or conferences that I go to. Thanks for sure. Should go on. Okay. So there has been a lot of questions, and like I said, the the issue with being a law enforcement officer. If you look by statute, a law enforcement officer is somebody, and it says it, uh, well, I have a handout, and I'll hand it out to you afterwards, but anyway, what it says is that a law enforcement officer, by statute, is a peace officer. So, when we look at it from that standpoint, yes, I was a peace officer. Now, when you start talking about, from an organizational standpoint, my organization appointed people to the FBI Safe Streets. They appointed people to the ATF as FTOs, or, uh, or not FTOs, TFOs, Task Force Officers. Now, when you start looking at my actual experience of being out in the street, working on the street, or working in the street, having worked for the department and a state, a state entity, we were able to work with other law enforcement agencies around the state and we were able to take part in things like gang interdiction and uh, fugitive apprehension. So the formal part of, of driving around the streets, I did have that as well, but that was as, was as a reserve officer. But when you ask about my time out on the streets and... Time. Thank you, Mr. Our next 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. Close to me. Oh, my apologies. Don't have an opinion. Thank you. All right, our second question. Who do you plan to have or serve as your command staff? And we'll begin with Mr. Gilliland. So, it's no secret. I have not picked an undersheriff. And the reason being is, I, like I've told everybody right from the beginning, I'm going to look at this and run this like a business. I want to make sure that I'm getting the most qualified candidate or applicant that I can. Because I want to appoint somebody who has not just the same experience that I have, but greater in whatever those positions are. So when it comes to an undersheriff, there's going to be an application process. I'll actually have community members coming in sit during that application process. The same thing goes with you know, anybody else. If I know there's going to probably be turnover, but at that point in time, we'll have people come in and apply for the position. So as far as who I'm going to have as my command staff, that's yet to be determined. Well, I think my staff has done a, a great job ever since I took office. I, I've, I've uh, had to replace my undersheriff you know, four years ago, and, and Ken's doing a great job. So uh, Ken Kimsey will continue to be my undersheriff. Uh, Dennis Alston will continue to be my patrol lieutenant. Uh, I, I just promoted a new uh, detention lieutenant, Mike Hardy. He, he worked detentions prior and, and then went to... Uh, or patrol, and now he's back to uh, to detention. So he's he's worked both sides of the fence. I got Bill Dolan Investigations. He does an awesome job helping everybody, and and so we're gonna we're gonna continue from there. Our next question, then. Uh, this is a two-parter, but we'll put them together. It says, how have you dealt with challenges in your past situations, and do you consider yourself a person of high integrity, and why? Sure. I think uh, we've dealt with challenges. I've dealt with challenges as a professional in this, this job. It's been uh, complicated the last several years with all the legislation changes that's when went in the state of Colorado as, as far as the new penalties for, for drugs and, and things like that. Um, so that, that's been the biggest challenges in the last four years. As far as the second question goes, I think I'm a, I'm a great man of integrity. I, I don't play fa favorites with people. Um, I, my own son spent the night in jail when he got a DUI, so we, we don't play favorites, so everybody's treated fair in this county, and everybody's treated equal. Sure. Mr. Gilliland. And I guess life is full of challenges, right? Uh, from a professional level, it's having to deal with an ever-changing like, set of legislation. When I was working for parole, every governor you got in, there was a new set of legislation that came in. So dealing with it is just bucking up putting your boots on and pushing forward. Now, do I find myself to be a man of integrity? Yes, I do. Absolutely. There's things that, you know, I've had to work through my life and it's all been it's all been due to the fact that I look at things from other people's perspectives and how I would how I would handle that based on their their viewpoints as well. Thank you. Our next question, do you support term limits for the Logan County Sheriff position? Why or why not? I will start with Mr. Gilliland. Well, the, my initial opening speech that I had planned before I knew that we had to do a three-minute speech was one of the parts of it, of it was that I am for term limits. And I'll tell you exactly why I'm in, in favor of term limits. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because no one person, not one single person, should have that much concentrated power for that longer period of time. No one. It, even if it starts up at the upper echelons of our government, all the way down to our local government. 
No way. Well, in Logan County, we do have term limits. They're sitting right here in front of us. It's our constituents. So um, when they say we're done, we're done. Sure. <laughs> now, this may be a little difficult to answer in the short amount of time, but directed to both. What are the biggest issues? facing Logan County currently, and I would assume that be to you your department. Louder? Sorry? Louder. Can you go? I couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are the biggest issues facing Logan County currently, and I'm assuming that's directed towards the Sheriff's Department. Sure. Well, I think the biggest issues right now is the legislation that's been passed over the last several years. I um, mean, it's, it's tied our hands with uh, how the the, we prosecute people, the penalties that they're getting um, over and over again. We're arresting people, we're putting them in jail. Um, judges are letting them out. Um, we've, we've faced the drug issue ever since I've been here, since 1996. And they've changed the penalties so much on that. Um, now it's pretty much a slap on the hand if you have less than four grams. It's a misdemeanor ticket, no jail time. Um, and you're back out on the street. So that's one of the biggest issues that we face in this county is, is the judicial system uh, moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Gilliland. Well, I agree. Drugs are a problem. They are a big problem. They have been for the last, what, 16 years now? <clears throat> um, but what I found is, is that no matter what happens, and this happens when I was working for poll, like I said, legislation changes. You still have to put your boots on, you still have to trudge forward, and you still have to do your job. It doesn't matter how much work it takes. It doesn't matter long how, how long it takes. <coughs> but your every single minute should be focused on the safety of those people that, you're, that you've been tasked and entrusted with protecting. Thank you. What has been the biggest impact and changes on law enforcement from State Bill or Senate Bill 217? We'll start with Mr. Gilliland. Well, I had it down here for a second. And 217. Oh, okay. All right. So, 217. The biggest issue is with um, the liability to the county. Uh, that's what you're hiring me for, is right to mitigate liability. And what I mean by liability is if you're not training your people, if you don't have clear cut policies, if you don't have clear cut policies, then, and you hire the right people that you know are going to carry through with those duties the way that they were taught, the way that, that it's been explained to them, then you are going to end up, you are going to end up in a lawsuit. The bigger thing is, though, is knowing, or your staff should know, that if they're doing the things that they're taught, that you have their back. You can indemnify them from that liability. So that actually, that actually plays into the function of being able to go out and do your job. Because I've heard a lot of people say, I can't do my job because I'm worried about 217. I can't, worry, I can't do my job because I'm worried about, you know, 1263. So that's my take on it. Uh, clearly, my opponent hasn't studied what 217 is. Um, it requires us to have body cams by 2023. We've had body cams for the last uh, four, five, six years. Um, it also, one of the big issues with that is it takes the qualified immunity off the deputies and the, and the police officers that we used to have. That's one reason why uh, you've seen the mass exodus within, within those um, areas with law enforcement. You know, it's also, um, 
made it hard to, to recruit people with 217. Um, that's that's the big is, biggest issues with it, and and we've been moving forward with 217 ever since it passed. Actually, we've been ahead of it. Thank you both. <clears throat> the next question, would you or when would you enforce a red flag law? And we'll start with Sean. Well, as far as the red flag um, ordinance goes, um, if we would get a court order as a red flag, we would enforce that. Um, the way we have done with the firearms in the past, if somebody's uh, committed or charged with domestic, um, the court gives them a form to sign that says they will not have or possess firearms. Um, they have an option to turn those firearms over to a licensed firearms dealer, law enforcement, or family and friends. As law enforcement, we do not have the capacity to keep those firearms, so they've been turned over to uh, uh, firearms dealers and or family or friends after they pass a background check that they can possess firearms. Mr. Gillowin. Well... I guess his position's changed a little bit, but um, enforcing the red flag laws. You see, you can't speak in absolutes. A little louder. I'm sorry, you can't speak in absolutes. So, and what I mean by absolutes, I've, I've heard people say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <coughs> I'm not going to enforce that law. It's all, I guess, what you would say, dependent on the circumstances. Because when you say I'm not going to enforce a law, or I'm not going to enforce that law, you're either being disingenuous or you're ill-informed. Thank you both. Um, our next question is, officer retention has been a nationwide issue. Some agencies are able to keep staff, some are not. Without using pay as an answer, what do you personally bring to the table to create a thriving workforce with the best interests of Logan County in mind. We'll start with Mr. Gillen. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up, to be honest with you. Um, retention is a big problem here. And there's, how do I say this? There's been a lot of, there's been a lot of, like, what I would say, lower level things that have been done to retain people. But it starts with doing your job analysis. Not doing your job analysis, finding out those things that people want or the skills that are needed, and then being able to go ahead and tag onto the bottom something that you would identify as that golden goose, right? That thing, that, that part of the officer that you want. And that has to do with, like, let's just say emotional intelligence. Then you have to start managing what's called your organizational brand. And if you're having negative reviews out there, there's, there's a statistic, and I have facts that I was going to pass out today, but 56% of people will not, will not apply if there's a negative review about your organization. That, it, and that is the killer when it comes to retention. It also has to do with your job posting. When you have a job posting put up and there is, I'm sorry, there is, there is, there isn't a sufficient hook and a hook is what pulls them in. If there's not a sufficient hook, then you will end up losing candidates. So, from my from my perspective, it does start. I think it's the, the to, to recruit candidates we're facing right now with um, the workforce, um, not just in law enforcement in general, but throughout the country. For some reason, nobody wants to work. Um, we've, we've had a, a turnover rate in Logan County. Um, a lot of it has to do, we bring people in, especially the detention side. You know, they, they say they want to do the job. They get in there, and it's not what they signed up for. Uh, a lot, lot of the younger crowd, uh, it's not what they signed up for. They get in there, and they can't. 
they can't handle um, the shift work and things like that. And that's one of the big, big things with law enforcement. They're, Nobody wants to work nights, nobody wants to work holidays, and that's one of the biggest issues that we face is, is, is people that want to come in and, and dedicate their life and career to law enforcement. Thank you, sir. Okay, our next question. In what way would you implement current technology to assist in the sheriff's office and jail? And how would you fund these expenditures? And we'll start with Sheriff Paul. So we've we're we're moving forward right now with technology. We've we've uh, we've got computers for our cars at uh, no cost whatsoever, other than the air cards. They were donated by some bigger agencies in Colorado, Douglas County, Arapaho County. Um, so it's it's been a very low cost on on our side. Um, the county has uh, the, the half cent sales tax that was used for the for the justice center that they moved over to uh, help fund improvements to the jail. We've improved our camera system out there, our boards for the our control boards, control rooms. So that money's available, um, and everybody that shops in Logan County, whether they're from here or not, are helping pay for that. So that's what we've done. Moving forward, we'd like to implement drones into our program to uh, help us investigate crime. <coughs> and there's grants out there for that. Mr. Gilliland. I'd like, to, excuse me, I'd like to look at things as return on investment. All right. So, if what technology or how would I implement it and how would it pay off <coughs> to the general public? So one of the one pieces of the technology that I'd like to implement is license plate readers. That gives you instant, that gives you an instant read whether that vehicle's stolen. So the actual cost for that, I believe, is right around sixty-five thousand uh, dollars. Now, I believe the stole the, the vehicles that have been stolen in Logan County, we've only recovered I think thirty-six thousand. There's a total of like eighty-nine thousand. That's that's just what I was what I was looking at. So. What I'm saying is, is let's just say, for instance, at $65,000, if I recover a stolen vehicle that's, let's just say, the, a used vehicle is about $25,000, I do one of those for each year of my term. That's $100,000 worth of stolen vehicles recovered. You'll see a, you'll see a return on investment of about $35,000. The other piece of equipment that I'd like to have or like like to purchase would be a handheld digital or density scanner. And what that does is it, cut, it makes your deputies more efficient in the, when they do or they stop vehicles. Now granted you have dogs, there's dogs and sometimes those work and sometimes they don't. It's just like any other tool. But the density scanner is less evasive and there's less time. Thank you both for that response. <coughs> All right, our next question. There has been multiple fentanyl deaths, fentanyl is a drug, in Logan County over the past few months. What is being done or what do you plan to do to address the dangers of fentanyl and resulting deaths? We'll start with Mr. Gilliland. I'm actually glad you brought that up. I just, what was it, about, about three weeks ago, I went to a, I was put on by a treatment provider and it addressed the, the fentanyl overdose, overdose deaths. Um, and as everyone, it's no secret, I'm a big advocate of educating people. I'm a big advocate of having your deputies educate people. Because without that education that's out there, you're going to make ill informed decisions. Even as, I mean, like as a kid, think about it as a kid, you'll make those ill informed decisions. And that's what I'm about, is educating. The public about the dangers. What does it look like? Is it what is it in? I've had a talk with a couple of my friends as uh, kids, and I told them, I said, "Hey, you know what? I know smoking marijuana you think is the cool thing, but right now it's being laced. That fentanyl's being laced into pretty much everything. So please, don't, don't use it. Because guess what? That wasn't out there. Nobody had informed them. Not one person had let them know. And I'll, I'll ask you this." There's been seven deaths 
possibly a... How many of you out there actually know about it? Or haven't heard it from a second source? And that's what I'm talking about, is getting out and informing the public. Well, how we're going to battle this is we're going to we're going to work with our legislators to get the the laws, the drug laws, changed back the way they were. We fought as an organization with County Sheriffs of Colorado, CAPC, which is the the chiefs, and also the FI, FOP to get zero grams of fentanyl for possession, and they agreed to one. One gram of fentanyl will kill up to 200 people, and we do do have a. a problem with that coming into Logan County but the biggest part is to is to change the legislation back the way it is like I said I got the dogs they just got 50 pills off the street of fentanyl in Proctor here a couple of weeks ago and that's how we're gonna battle it boots on the ground get out there I'm gonna stand up with the rest of the sheriffs and the chiefs and get the legislation changed back the way it should be on all the drugs so they can go to prison where they belong instead of out re-victimizing our communities. Thank you both. Very pertinent yeah. questions. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, something that also impacts us greatly. What can be done at the county level to address mental health concerns for your employees? So mental health concerns, we, we uh, contract with Dave Christensen out of Greeley. Um, he does all of our uh, background checks, pre-employment checks. Um, if we have issues that happen with, with deputies or staff, um, we send them to Dr. Dave, is what we, who we refer to him to, and they will go uh, see him. Um, we do cover the co-pays for the employees when they go see him, um, and the insurance, our insurance picks up the rest. Um, we have brought Dr. Dave into our office to speak with employees on mental health, and he's available to us 24-7 when needed. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gilliland. I don't like to look at it as an employee thing. I really don't. I like to look at it as a human being thing. Being able to make connections with your employees enough to where you can understand what their problems are. And then when you find out that they have a problem, because that's the first part about dealing with mental health illness, right? Is understanding it. Or mental health issues is understanding it. So, yes, absolutely. I couldn't tell you from an internal standpoint what mechanisms he has set in place. But I can tell you this much. It will be, from a personal standpoint, it will be from here that it's addressed. All right. The small rural towns in Logan County do not have their own law enforcement, nor do they have the funds to implement any. <coughs> Many of the towns have reported that they struggle with speeding vehicles and traffic concerns. How can this issue be addressed by the Sheriff's Department? Let's start with Mr. Gilliland. Most of you know that, uh, if you haven't seen my website, go, go to gillandsheriff.com. But, it's called analytical targeting. You're using data that you've collected. Because let's be honest, right now, right now they're short people, right? Like they can't get people out to calls even when people are calling. So you use analytical targeting. And what that does is it points people or it, it clusters the calls that come in and then that's where you look at it. That's how you deal with that issue. So let's just say that there is an issue out on County Road 42 and people are running through stop signs. The other part is letting people know, saying, hey, pop up your camera get on your Facebook and say, hey, I'm going, to be out running, I'm going to be out running radar that night or that day. And guess what? Your whole job anyway is to gain compliance, is to make it a safer area. So that's exactly how I plan on doing it. I plan on using analytical targeting. Thank you. Oh, I'm 
Sure. <laughs> <laughs> to we, we do, we do, we do answer those calls in the towns, and I get, I get feedback from the towns how they like us there. Um, when they ask for extra patrol, if they're speeding, the guys will go out there. Um, we have a great relationship with our, with our partners at the Highway State Patrol. So um, when they, we do have those complaints, we send those out to their areas. We've had a great concern out on County Road 34 every year of the trucks out there when they're hauling silage. Um, I get motor carrier involved, they go out there also, and so we, we work as a team. That's kind of what we have to do. We're all short-handed, so th their concerns are being answered. <laughs> All right, how do you mitigate the liability to the county of deputies utilizing county vehicles? We'll start with you. How do you mitigate the liability to the county, sorry, to the county of deputies utilizing county vehicles? I'm going to take this question as um, all my people have take home patrol cars. And one of the reasons behind that is response. So if something happens, um, they can respond from their residence at any time to whatever is going on, natural disaster, homicide, whatever we need them for. So that is the reason that uh, we have take-home vehicles. Another reasoning is, um, you know, those vehicles are sitting in the neighborhoods. So it's, it's a dirt deterrent in itself to have, have the, those vehicles setting out, out there, but. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Goodwin. Uh, I, mean, I guess I'll take a different spin on it a little bit. Um, it's that mitigate liability, right? So, I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna take it from the standpoint, the standpoint of mitigating liability. Li liability being using it to haul your children or your wife or taking it outside or taking it outside of the county. That will be strict policy put in place. It will be to and from your home. Now, I take a little bit of a little bit of a uh, page from where I came from. You can stop off and get a gallon of milk if you're if it's in route from your home but other than that to mitigate liability when you when you have a, your child or your spouse in there that is a, that is a big big issue because when you start talking about lawsuits or collisions that happen <coughs> that will cost the county millions <laughs> All right then, what do you feel would be the ideal allocation between your department's facilities, meaning administrative, patrol, uh, detention, etc.? We'll start with Mr. Gillum. So, okay, well, you know, it was about administrative. Right, it's right. uh, the allocation of funding between departments such as administrative, patrol, detention, and so Okay, the funding. So when we start talking about funding, we're going to look at it in terms of, like again, like I said, the amount of service that it's provided, right? So administrative, you know, I would probably say you're probably looking at maybe about 20%. The road, you're probably looking at another 40%. And the detention facility, you're looking at a 40% a 40 allocation. Thank you, Mr. Gillen. Sure. Well, as far as allocations of funds go, um, each side is different. We ran 
probably close to a $4 million budget, half of that being on the jail side, half of it being on the, the admin patrol side of things. Um, our costs really haven't increased in the last 16 years, other than food, medical, uh, gas, vehicle maintenance, and, and, and wages, but as far as the um, supplies and things like that, I've been able to keep keep it pretty pretty much the same for 16 years. So we really haven't had that big of an increase. And today I just signed three IGAs to house inmates from three different counties. So that's going to help us out on the jail side for funding. What are some of the Excuse me, let me start again. What are some sources of stress in your personal and work life, and how do you manage that stress? And we'll start with Cheryl. Some of the sources of stress? I, I, you know, I, I, think, I think the whole job is, is stress in law enforcement, but, you know, um, I think the personnel side of this job is, is the is one of the biggest things if we, if we didn't have, you know, to worry about personnel, you know, it, it would be less stressful, but unfortunately that's one of the biggest things we have to worry about. I have to worry about my guys every single day they go out there. As far as how I relieve stress, I love the outdoors. I spend a lot of time camping, riding my buggy, hunting, that's how I relieve stress and being with my family. So, I don't know how many you have kids. That's a big stress for me. Um, and it is. It's a big stress. It doesn't matter if they're younger or, or as they get older, they're still a stress to you. Um, from a professional standpoint, when elected sheriff, it would be, actually he's right, whether they come home at night to their families. So, how do I deal with that stress? Well, I like to exercise. I like to go out and go hunting and, and fishing, and I uh, shoot a little bit, but that's how I relieve the stress. All right, our next question then. What changes in leadership and philosophy have to be made to deal with the ever-changing demands on law enforcement? What changes in leadership and philosophy, and I'm assuming I mean like leadership style, and philosophy have to be made to deal with the ever-changing demands on law enforcement? We'll start with you. Thank you. So the philosophy change that needs to happen, though, is, or from a leadership standpoint, you have to be a transformational leader. And that means you work every day to make sure that your, their employees are the best that they can be. And the reason that's important, <coughs> because when you start talking about hiring, let's just say Gen Z's, Gen Z's, they want to know when they, co when they go to your place of employment, that they have career paths, that they have security, that they have a way to move up and develop themselves. So, as a philosophy or a leadership style, you absolutely have to be a transformational leader. And, and a little bit mixed with a situational leadership, too. Like, you have to be able to change with them as well. So, as your, as your troops progress, or your deputies progress, you allow them free reign to take care of the business they need to take care of. I think the biggest challenge with growing as a leader is, is, yes, it's the new generation coming up. I mean, you have to, um, I don't want to say coddle, but that's kind of a, a good word to use. I mean, you have, they, they, they want to know how much money they're going to make, you know, how fast they're going to get there, you know, you know where are they going to go? And a lot of them these days, they don't, they don't necessarily care about the longevity, they want money. They want to know how much money they can make and they're going to go somewhere that they can make more money. And I don't, 
don't think is trying to set them down and say, you know, there is a career path here, retirement, insurance, and things like that, but with so many vacancies in law enforcement out there, the challenge that I face with the younger generation is they want to go somewhere where they can make more money. All right, thank you both. Very pertinent question here. How can you work with the district and state court systems to enforce local <coughs> Oh. How can you work with the district and state court system to enforce local crimes? And I'm assuming it means local laws to decrease crime. Well, you know, we have to work as a sheriff's office with the with the state courts, county courts, every single day. Um, but our challenges are, like I said, is the new legislation that's been passed. The judges have new bond schedules. We have weekend bond now. I'm not sure why we have weekend bond. It's, it's a tax burden on the taxpayers. And right now I'm kind of in trouble with the, with the courts because they're, they're PR bonding a lot of people and we've been blamed as law enforcement. Why are these people running the street? Why are they running the street? Well, now I'm putting it out there that this is what's going on and as soon as they, we put them in, the judge PR bonds them out and we have that vicious cycle again. So I would like to work with them to change the laws back to the way they were where they're spending more time in jail than getting back on the streets. Well, I look at it as a partnership. <clears throat> Excuse me. I look at it as a partnership. You have to work together well with each other, right? You have to understand that there's professional boundaries or things that you don't do. So, to me, the way that I would work with my judges when it comes to enforcing the law, or enforcing the law when you, when you talk from a municipal standpoint, is to build those relationships. To have that understanding, saying, hey, guess what? You know, we know the laws have changed. Let's try to let's try to work out something for the best that will absolutely allow there to be a safer community that will actually be equitable for everybody involved. This is the last question, and then we'll move on. We'll have uh, some final briefs here. But how should the general public respond to people on patrol or on parole, excuse me, as they are out and about in the community? How should the general public respond to the people out on parole as they are out and about in the community? We'll start with Mr. Gilman. I promise that was not a planning question. I promise you that. <laughs> uh, how should they be, how should they respond? They're human beings. Just like you and I. So as long as they're doing what they're supposed to, and they're taking care of paying back their debt to society, then why shouldn't you treat them just like anybody else? Just like a human being. And then once they get out, or once they're done with their term, thank you for doing what you were supposed to. Because as an officer, as a full officer, I, it was the reward of somebody saying thank you or them being successful was minimal. And I, had, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, there was a lot of that when you see somebody on the street you hold that against them. People make mistakes in the world and people go on probation, they go on parole. And like Mr. Gilligan said, we, we uh, um, 
We hold them the same as what we hold everybody else. They have standards. They do what they're, they're supposed to do. They're just like the rest of us. Um, if they step out of bounds, we have ways to help them get on the right path. We've got the Calm Corps uh, board. They can go back out to community corrections, get back online with their jobs. But I have friends that's been to prison. They've successfully completed their parole, probation, whatever, and they're, they're great people. Thank you both. Now at this point, we're going to uh, allocate three minutes to each of the candidates to see if there's any question that we asked that you maybe feel like you didn't get enough time to address. And we'll start with you, Sheriff. I don't think that there w was a question we didn't have time to address, but is this kind of our closing? No, we have a closing. Okay. I, I think that I've had ample time to answer the questions that I was given. Thanks, sir. And Mr. Gillen. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> There's more time for our uh, wrap up here. Now we're going to take um, about seven minutes for each candidate to give their final presentation to us. We've gone through all of the questions that were kind of congealed together, and I think they were very pertinent and time time. -like. So we will start uh, with Sheriff Powell. So, like I said, I've spent my whole career in Logan County. Half my life has been spent in Logan County. I've served this community, I've raised my family. Um, this is my home. I care about the people of this county. I've done everything that I've been asked to do. The trainings, I went to trainings. You know, I, I just feel passionate that that I've, I've served this county. And we've moved forward ever since I've, I've been here. And we keep moving forward. And like I said before, um, moving forward these next four years, you know, we want to try to get another canine. We've already started getting grant money for that to help fight the, the drug problems in Logan County. We know there's drug problems here. There's always been drug problems here. We have to work with the legislation to to fix those problems, to repeal those um, drug laws that were put in, in place. <coughs> this job's not just about being a corrections officer. A corrections officer is not a peace officer in Colorado. A parole officer is a correction officer, is not. There's lots of duties that we are required to do statutorily as the sheriff in Colorado. And I put a list of those on the back table back there. It's not just being the keeper of the jail and maintaining a jail. It's working with the courts. It's working with the legislatures. It's working with the, the DAs. We have to do what the laws tell us to do. We have several, several duties front and back as a sheriff, not just the keeper of the jail. And one of the most important duties, probably as the sheriff, is civil process on a daily <coughs> basis. My guys don't like that, but that's one of the biggest, biggest problems and obstacles of our job. Moving forward, You're not going to be disappointed because I will keep this office going at high standards and I will continue to be your sheriff for the next four years. When you go to the ballot box, check Brett Powell for Logan County Sheriff and I look forward to serving you for another four years. Thank you. I don't think mine's going to be quite that long. Um, and I did, I'm not going to lie. I had a, another long, drawn out, you know, speech I was going to give. But I'll be honest with you, you already know what you have. You already know what's there. The question you have to ask yourself, 
Do you feel safer today than you did yesterday? And the next question is, why is that? You're right, I understand. It's not about running just corrections, but it is 50% of your responsibility. And I also understand that patrols the other 50%. But I also understand, and I just, to be quite honest with you, I just watched a thing on the TV today that said businesses are not businesses, but law enforcement agencies are turning more to a business run type of atmosphere. So, like I said, you have a clear choice to make. If you support Mr. Powell, so be it. But you have to figure out whether you feel safer today than you did yesterday. Thank you. Being a moderator isn't quite as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> job next time yeah yeah <laughs> so that ends uh, tonight's presentation I do want to thank both candidates um, you know we live in an amazing little community and county um, I moved here nine years ago I chose to retire here um, I have a special needs son that I wanted to be in an environment where he could feel safe or he felt that he could go to our neighbors if he needed help or someone else or that if he was lost, someone would help him. And I believe we have that community. So I thank all of you for being here tonight on behalf of the Chamber, on behalf of the Farm Bureau, who not only provided our timers, but put the questions together very respectfully. Thank you for your presence and your concern. And um, I know our ballots came in the mail today, so it's not too far away. So continue to support our community as you have, and thank you for being with us tonight. Please help yourself to some snacks on the way out, and thank you again. Please, uh, another round of applause. For and thank you all very much. Have a good evening.